Hi there, we're Rachel and Ian, and we're delighted to be at RopeCon. We run high concept, one-off LARPs with our friends under the banner of Crooked House. We're here to talk about our careers and our approach to design. We've been doing LARP for a very long time, but we also make computer games, books, films, and other creative projects. I'm Rachel. I'm a veterinary surgeon, but also a photographer, producer, performer, and writer. And I'm Ian, I'm a narrative designer for computer games, a writer, a director, a games programmer. Uh, as Rachel said, we've been doing this for a very long time and we've been asked to talk to you about how we got here and how we design our games. And I think we've got away with this. This is only the seventh take. Something like that. We both grew up in Scotland, Ian in Aberdeen in the northeast, me in Eyre in the west, in the 1970s, so in the time before the internet. We both tabletopped when we were at school. Ian played D&D, Dungeons and Dragons, and I played Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay, or Woofrup, with my brother and his friends when I finally managed to bully them into letting me join. Myself and my brother first heard about LARP way back on a BBC TV programme, a kids TV programme in the early 1980s called Blue Peter. And there was a segment in that programme which showed off people going to a castle, dressing up in costume and fighting each other with safe weapons. Dye or poster paint was used to determine how much damage had been done to you during a fight. Weapons were covered in poster paint and as you'd imagine it wasn't the best thing to promote good costuming. My brother and I didn't actually try live role playing till later on, probably 89, 90. Uh, we encountered somebody who built latex weapons for a living and we helped him out in his workshop and he started running adventures for us. There were a few systems around at the time, and they were all based loosely on that original castle system back at Peckforton, uh, a system called Treasure Trap. They all ran in a very similar way, which is a type of adventure that we in the UK have always called linears. You would go through an area of something like forest, and along the path, you as adventurers would encounter different groups of monsters or other NPC characters. Almost always you would have a fight of some sort, you would achieve your goal at the end and then you'd head back to base. You were accompanied with a GM and after each fight the game would stop and the GM would look at your kit and see how many new bits of dye you had on your clothing. They'd mark that off in a character sheet. There wasn't much in the way of props and we've already talked about the quality of the costumes and the weapons weren't great either so an awful lot of it at that time was done in imagination. The GM would often explain to you what you could see. Over there is a great valley. That's a, a fire pit of lava, all those sort of things. And it was really not much of a, an advance from the old games of Let's Pretend and Cowboys and Indians that people played at school when we were kids. After a year or two of that, myself and my brother heard about this amazing event somewhere in the middle of England called Summerfest. And in 1991, we went along to Summerfest. Summerfest was, well, a huge event to us. I think it must have been somewhere between 1,000 and 1,500 people at that time. It consisted of two big factions, the Horde and the Volunteers, and on the end day they would get together and have a big battle. It was a collection of different clubs who came from all over, and they all had their own backgrounds, or their own plots, and in some cases totally different genres. I remember at the very first Summerfest playing laser tag in one corner and being chased by an alien while there were traps and thieves and fantasy scout missions going on at the other side of the event. It was followed up the next year by a thing called The Gathering, which we'll talk about quite a lot later on because Rachel and I spent an awful lot of time involved with it over the years. The Gathering and Summerfest were both events set in big field areas with bits of woodlands to play in as well. And what looked like to us as young kids, thousands of tents around the place and loads of people in costume and character. And it was incredible. We'd never seen anything like it. And we fell in love with it instantly. We'll talk a lot more about that later on. But for now, Rachel and I actually met. Ian and I met at Glasgow University. This is the old building of Glasgow University, which is pretty stunning and unfortunately isn't Hogwarts, although it looks pretty similar. But we didn't get to spend a lot of time there. Ian was along the road in a nasty 1970s building studying computer science. I was often in the veterinary buildings 
which were several miles away from the rest of the university. We did, however, come together as members and later committee members of IO, the University Science Fiction Society. With other people from the Science Fiction Society, we ran sci-fi conventions, SCON in 1992 and Hypotheticon in 1994. For Hypotheticon, Ian built this amazing Dalek, which was the guest of honour for the convention. Unfortunately, he built it in the bedroom of his student flat and then discovered that it didn't actually fit out of the door. So the Dalek had to be sectioned, removed from the flat and reassembled. But it still looks pretty good afterwards. We organised freeform LARPs and games set in the world of the Vampire the Masquerade. We ran mega games or early versions of them with a bunch of people around different tables in rooms playing different political powers or groups on a spaceship who all had contrasting opinions and directions and aims. We ran citywide games such as Killer and other games which involved interaction with the players whilst trying to avoid upsetting the general public. The other thing that we did at university was we set up Cuckoo's Nest, the university LARP society, because the Science Fiction Society didn't actually want to have anything to do with running LARP, although a lot of our players overlapped. We set up the society in 93, mostly because if you were an official society, that gave you access to university funding from the clubs and societies, and also let you use the university minibuses, which was a major bonus at the time. As Cuckoo's Nest, we ran linears in a local country park, and we also ran evening games in local pubs, which were called tavern nights. The Cuckoo's Nest is still running at Glasgow University today, which is a pretty good legacy to have left them, I think. Here we are with a bunch of Cuckoo's Nest members at the gathering in 1995, where we played the Leos Alpha. But eventually all good things have to come to an end, and Ian and I both graduated from university and left Glasgow. Having left Glasgow, we moved to rural Wales, pretty much in the middle of nowhere. I was a vet and with aspirations of being James Herriot, I was working in a very mixed practice, going to see cattle and sheep and horses and occasionally treating dogs and cats in the surgery as well. On our free weekends, we spent our time driving around the country to LARP events. My job came with a car, so it actually meant that we could get much further afield and get involved in all sorts of things. Locally, we spent our time in Llandovery Theatre, working with a wonderful couple there and acting and writing for them. At this point, I'd like to introduce a new cast member. This person, in the various forms you can see him here, is my brother. Bill. Um, he's the one who I first discovered LARP with and first went to Summerfest and The Gathering with. He makes things, as you can see, he makes these weird costumes. He started out working for an attraction in London called Alien War, based around Ridley Scott's Aliens movies. Since then, he has gone on to do all sorts of things. He was involved in building the castle for Hogwarts in the movies. Things like the dagger for Prince of Persia, the robot from the Hugo movies, lots and lots of art department and props and bits and pieces, you know, even the, the new Star Wars, for example. But since then, he's turned his hand to film directing, and we'll talk a little bit about that later. But at the time we were in the middle of Wales, he had done his work on Alien War and was looking for something else to do. And so was I, because there was nothing else to do in the middle of Wales. We started a company together, a company to make LARP weaponry, masks, monsters, all sorts of things like that. I was just out of university. Bill was a couple of years younger than me. We didn't really know what we were doing. We put out a catalogue with a load of ridiculous things in it. We got all our prices wrong. Somebody gave us some funding and we spent six months to a year making stuff, throwing around glue, latex, plaster moulds, all sorts of things learning a lot, but fundamentally not making a lot of money. Eventually, we had to decide that Wales didn't need a LARP prop company, and we went our separate ways. He went to work in the film industry, and I started working for a cartoon studio. 
It was an old fashioned style of cartoon studio. Things were still drawn on pieces of paper, frame by frame in pencil, and backgrounds were airbrushed and everything would have to be scanned in. Computers had only really started to take off in that industry relatively recently. I worked for a part of the company that was interested in multimedia, kids' educational games for well-known characters such as Fireman Sam. I worked as a programmer and designer there, and because it was a really small company, did everything from the box art to writing music and scripts. It was a good time and a great way to learn lots of things at once. So while Rachel was working as a vet and I was working on multimedia for kids, we were still LARPing, and most of our time was spent at The Gathering. The Gathering started in 1992. Ian was at that first gathering and a group of the rest of us from the Cuckoo's Nest University Role Playing Society went in 1993 and continued to attend for many years afterwards. The Gathering had no coherent background, although they did try and impose one a little bit later, which meant that you had people from lots of different clubs and societies all arriving with their own backstory and characters who didn't really fit together into this huge 2000 person event in some fields in the Midlands. This lack of coherent background meant that you could end up with space orcs talking to Victorian time travellers and then being attacked by a group of Dark Ages Celts. At its biggest, the gathering had about 3,500 attendees. It ran with one big event a year, the gathering itself, and three smaller ones through the summer. And these were large scale camping events in a field, which always finished with a big battle on the Monday. The scale of this was quite impressive. You did have armies of hundreds, if not thousands of people clashing across a field and the charges were something to behold. But the battles weren't the only thing about the event. There was quite a lot going on in that field. This was generated by factions, so nations and guilds, which were things like the armourers or the archers. And each of these had their own NPC crew and a plot team, which sometimes overlapped. It wasn't necessarily coherent and often you would find the plot teams were pulling in different directions or in fact running contradictory plot to the confusion of the players. We played lots of different characters at the gathering over the years and got involved in running, organising. The dragons were a bunch of Celtic Dark Ages characters drawing heavily on the mythology and the stories from Wales and Ireland. We spent a lot of time writing plot and story and backstory and world mythology for the dragons. And during this time, we made some of our closest friends who we still see to this day. At least we do when COVID's not around. Apart from the LT's four main events, the system also ran sanctioned events smaller events held throughout the year for a smaller group of players and normally run by a particular faction or guild. These could be atmospherically quite different from the gathering itself, but they still had to be approved by the gathering plot team and sanctioned to be an official event that happened in the LT world. These were generally much more immersive than the main LT events because you're working with a group of 30 to 60 players and could have a much more engaging story. And they, they varied. Some of them were up to five day camping trips in the forest, moving around woodlands whilst being attacked. Others were evening banquets in a castle. So there was quite a variety of scope, both in location and in the type of game for these sanctioned events. We decided as plot runners for the Dragons faction that we wanted to organize our own sanctioned events partly because we had stories that we thought we want to get out to the players, partly because, and this is a unifying theme with a lot of our work, we thought we could do it better than some of the events we'd seen. So we had to set out to prove that. So we set up an organization called Crooked House, which is our LARP running organization. And that includes myself, Rachel, Bill, my brother, and some close friends of ours we've worked with a long time over the years, Damien and Dan, and Kira later on, Bill's girlfriend and then later wife. We've run events as Crooked House since 2001, and as Rachel said, we started these office-sanctioned events for the LT, 
Our main aim was to be as immersive as we possibly could and, if possible, cinematic. And, of course, because of Bill's experience in the film industry and making props and costumes and special effects, we had a really good secret weapon in our arsenal. Our first event was Slag Demand, Slaughter Month, in 2001. It was our spin on a really gory folk horror set in the world of Dark Ages Celtic mythology. We buried monsters under the ground. We filled a charnel house with realistic gore. We managed to make two people throw up, which at the time we regarded as a big win, to be fair. Uh, remember, this was 2002, and we hadn't really even heard of the idea of player safety back in those days. But uh, our main things we were trying to do with all of these events were to try and do something that people hadn't seen before in other events, hadn't encountered. And if we could squeeze one or two things in there that they'd never seen, they'd talk about that and they'd tell their friends about that. And that was, that was fantastic. So after the success of Slug Demand, which went very well, we ran a series of events for the Dragon Faction with a changing roster of different organisers. We tried unusual event structures because at that time a lot of sanctioned events were very predictable. We tried very much for this cinematic feel. We always tried to put in visually stunning set pieces, thanks to Bill and later on Kira, and generally high quality special effects, so sound, pyros, lots of things which are a lot easier to do now because of new technology, but in those days people were only really starting to experiment with at live events. We always went for deep immersiveness, as deep as we could, in terms of costuming and props and theatre and lighting. And our aim, as I said, was always for people to talk about the events afterwards. We enjoyed running these, we learned a lot, and the events were very popular. But fundamentally, we got fed up with the strictures of running an event in somebody else's game world. It meant that there were so many things we couldn't explore. So uh, we decided we'd go off and do our own thing. With our new creative freedom, we ran Dick Britton in The Voice of the Seraph. This was a pulp action adventure in the style of Indiana Jones. For this, we wrote pre-generated characters in collaboration with our players. This was something that wasn't common in UK LARP at the time. Pre-play wasn't really a thing that outside groups of friends there. So normally you turned up with your character with few prepared interactions and no collaboration with the organisers, so they couldn't foreshadow things or draw on your backstory. Our pre-written characters allowed us to put a lot of hooks in there for our players and make it a far more immersive experience. The pulp action adventure setting allowed us to use cinematic moments to plan things which would make the players feel like heroes or protagonists in their own story and get lots of silly, light-hearted moments into something which could also be quite intense and immersive. This was back in 2005, but the players still talk about it. And the moments they remember, which is the key thing we want them to do, is to remember moments from our event. Well, there are probably two of them that they talk about the most. The first is when they came up the hill into the yard of a castle face to face with a tank which was firing at them, a full size tank. And that was jaw dropping for some of them. The other moment was our cast of thousands. We'd written on the poster there was going to be a cast of thousands. And it's a pulp adventure. So they went to explore a tomb. They managed to open the tomb doors, creep into this cave that we had dug into the sand dunes. And had thousands of locusts and insects falling on their head. Yeah, that provoked some screaming from some of them as well. We had a great time running the game and we learnt all sorts of interesting techniques from it, which we've used later in our LARP career. But at that time, we found that maybe LARP wasn't giving us everything that we needed it to. We started suffering from burnout. Now, at that time, we were pretty busy. Ian was working as chief technical architect for an interactive TV company and then later took on a job as CTO for an educational games company. I was a senior vet at a large practice now involved in running the company and working weekends. And this meant that often we were too tired for LARP. We'd been working on LARP alongside our day job for years and spent most of our weekends and most of our evenings doing something LARP related, often for little thanks or little payback. 
And it just felt like we were throwing a lot of our energy and our spare time and our enthusiasm into a black hole and not getting anything back. Over the next few years, we started looking outside LARP. So we went to try out things. We went to big festivals, things like Glastonbury, which has loads of fantastic set builds and large scale effects, great music as well. But we were really interested in what they'd done to make some of the areas of the Glastonbury field just amazing universes to step into. We went to the Edinburgh Fringe Festival in Scotland, which had loads and loads of little theatre, comedy, music, all sorts of acts done on a shoestring really inventively. Lots of spontaneous improvisation and and, uh, entertainment that would involve the audience very heavily. We also spent some time at the Beyond the Border Storytelling Festival, which ran every two years, not that far from where we used to live. And that gathered oral storytellers from across the world using different techniques from all sorts of traditions. And it was fascinating seeing the different tricks they would use to engage their audiences. We took part in street games, ranging from one-hour physical arcade games to whole days of city-wide experiences, visiting different locations, interacting with actors, people in costumes. Sometimes it was surprisingly like LARP, but with paid actors. uh, Paying actors is not a thing you hear of in LARP. And the general public with participants and the general public don't necessarily engage in role playing. So you have to write for them in a very different way. And that was that was fascinating. We started going to big live events, things like Punch Drunk, a theatre group who run very immersive events. You might have heard of things like Sleep No More, maybe, or The Drowned Man or The Mask of the Red Death. They set dress big locations with ridiculous level of detail, a ridiculous level of environmental storytelling, and they set off actors moving through those spaces. Uh, Something like The Drowned Man, for example, was a 1930s film set and backlot and the town around it and the desert next to it and some caravans and a hospital, all these things all in one big warehouse. All of the rooms were highly decorated with paintings, with notes to read, diaries, clocks on the wall, files, sound, lighting, everything. And then the actors would move through those spaces, carrying out their pre-written stories pretty much in a loop. There was some interaction with the audience, but the audience were very passive, mostly exploring as a viewpoint. And immersion was incredible. And the the environmental storytelling, as I said, was, was incredible. So we learned a lot from that. We also visited various secret cinema shows, including Moulin Rouge, Stranger Things and Blade Runner. Secret cinema are very good at creating an incredibly immersive environment. And particularly recently, they've started to hire actors who are really good at improvising and interacting with members of the public and the audience. They're adding game-like features. And I think each event they do has more and more game, more and more LARP, but it's difficult to figure out how to engage the general public on an event of this scale. There will be hundreds of people at a secret cinema evening, and how do you get all of them involved in a plot to a level that they're happy with? At times when it pays off, it's great, but it can be a somewhat frustrating experience, particularly for a role player, because we're looking for much more interaction, and we're used to getting it. And that's something that members of the public are surprised and thrilled when they get to talk to an actor at one of these things. Whereas we're trying to build our own story within the bigger narrative game world. And it's not quite set up for that yet, but it's still a great experience. And I would recommend it if you get the chance to go. And we still played some LARPs. We experimented with different genres, mainly getting away from the fantasy systems that we were used to and allowing ourselves to interact as different characters with our friends in a variety of different situations. So we learned lots of things from these different experiences, but we did actually seek out courses and structured events teaching us about other ways to tell story, to play games and to get involved in narrative. I went and did a bit of study with the team behind Punch Drunk and learned that, weirdly, a lot of the techniques and tricks they're using for their environmental storytelling and the way they set up how people interact with their actors 
is very similar to what's done in the computer game industry. Uh, and there were a lot of familiar design ideas coming from that. But that was quite an experience. They have set up a warehouse in London uh, that they have filled with buildings. They've made a, a small fake town indoors with a church, with a bar, with a main street, with shops, all sorts of things. And they use that as their R&D centre where they test new theatrical performances. And just having that space and the budget to experiment with is amazing. After Beyond the Border, I did a course on storytelling, oral storytelling, with somebody who's done it for a very, very long time, just learned the tricks of the trade there and how you approach it very differently. It's not what we're used to as improvisers. It's very much learning a pattern of ideas, being able to repeat that, and how do you illustrate that to your listeners and engage them and draw them in. I also studied with a film director and TV director. Bill's actually studied with the same person. His day job is to troubleshoot for movies. If a movie is in trouble, if they're struggling getting the plot across or they can't work with the actors in the right way, he goes in and spots what the problems are, helps them fix those problems and figures out how to actually tell the story and get it into the film camera. That taught me all sorts of interesting snippets of information that you just wouldn't typically find on a film directing course. He's actually got practical experience rather than studying from books and it made a really really big difference there are techniques in there that i've used in all walks of my creative life since while i was doing that rachel did photography courses focusing on lots of different photographic styles and one of the the reasons she was chasing these different styles was to deal with uh, photographing things like action movies which we'll talk about in a little bit and it's very different trying to photograph special effects shots than it is taking portrait photography for example and she also studied business and Italian at our local university, Cardiff University. And so given we'd learned all of these things, we started to try and put some of it into practice. At that point, my day job was very technical as a, a programmer and, and lead designer. So I started writing alongside that day job and wrote books, RPG systems, interactive fiction stories, um, played with writing screenplays for movies, pitches for TV shows, all sorts of things. And that took a lot of my spare time and that was probably foolish. So over the years, I decided I would try and make some of that writing my day job. I was still working full time, but I started doing more and more photography in my spare time and in a variety of different settings. So photographing film sets, burlesque performances, weddings, theatre performances and various live events. That was the thing that really appealed to me, getting atmospheric shots where someone had set up the lighting and the environment and you had actors who were deeply immersed in what they were doing or performers who were busy trying to give their best performance to an audience. There was no self-consciousness, there was no awkward body positions. These were just people who were really into what they're doing and I think that comes across in the photography. Bill was directing short films at that point, so Ian and I both got heavily involved in helping him out. Because of his background in art department and props, you get a really high quality film with high quality effects on screen, despite very small budgets. His partner Kira, who is now his wife, trained as a stunt woman, which meant that these films often had fight scenes or stunts which again are something that you don't see in most low budget films. You've got really dramatic on-screen movement, not just two talking heads sitting in a room. Because all of these were made with a small crew on tiny budgets, we worked in a variety of roles, helping out with writing, set building, directing, producing, and even as extras, whatever was needed. I was able to learn a lot about screenwriting and directing, and that paid off later in my career. But we were doing other things as well. I became heavily involved in the burlesque scene, taking photographs, but also performing, choreographing, costume and prop making. And that was quite a good substitute for LARP for a while, because it still had a lot of the elements that I enjoyed there, but without taking up all of your weekend. We went to Venice for Carnival several times over a number of years, with different groups and different character costumes and sets of masks. And in fact, in 2010, we accidentally won the Grand Masquerade competition and were the winning group in the whole of the Venice Carnival. Most of the costumes for Carnival are one very well-dressed person or perhaps a pair of matching costumes 
who walk slowly up and down the central catwalk in St Mark's Square to the adoration of the crowds. We turned up with a bunch of 16 rats, capered, made fun, threw cheese, larped at people and had an amazing time. And the organisers of the carnival appreciated the fact that we were taking it back to its original chaotic and fun routes and awarded us all a weekend in Venice as a prize. Slightly to our embarrassment because we didn't really feel we'd put that much work in and there were lots of people who had spent nine months building their costumes for this amazing event. And talking about entertaining the public, I began to do public speaking, talks on design for various games and interactive industry events, things like GDC or for BAFTA uh, and people like that. But why? I mean, all I've talked about so far is running educational games companies and things like that. Well, because while we were busy learning all these things, experiencing all these things, our careers had moved on. I'd switched from working on educational games to console and PC games, working on things like the Lego series of games, Little Big Planet, uh, and a bunch of others as a gameplay programmer, working on systems and how people interact with characters. After a few years of that, uh, writing in my spare time and doing all of these other things that we've talked about, I decided I didn't have enough time in my life. So I started to merge that writing into the work I was doing during the day, and I became a narrative designer and writer for games. Still doing some programming, but most of the time I spent making up characters and situations and designing things that people would encounter to tell them the story. So a lot of stuff that we'd drawn from LARP. All of these other skills suddenly became very relevant to what I was doing as a day job. In 2016, I opened Tailspinners with a colleague. This is a writing studio that works for game developers and publishers on the writing side. Often companies will need help with the writing, either it's not working and they need some consultancy on what's happening with the story and how to fix that, or perhaps they have lots and lots of pieces of writing they need, things like what characters are shouting to each other in the middle of battles, and they need help. So we started the company to do that. And it was uh, really successful. It's still going. I think I personally worked on more than 60 games in five years of Tailspinners, whereas most people in the games industry only work maybe on five or six in their whole career. I didn't do much work on each game, but lots and lots of little bits. Two days here, three days here, maybe six months here on all sorts of different topics. And it wasn't just games. We worked on TV, we worked on live experiences, we worked on uh, Skype-based games where you control people remotely, escape rooms, even promotional ARGs for international companies. And alongside that, I worked for the Swedish company Frictional Games. Uh, you might have heard of games such as Amnesia or Soma. I worked on Soma. And then most recently for them, I was story lead on the game Amnesia Rebirth, which took us five years to bring out. Whilst Ian's career in the games industry was taking off, I became much more senior in my veterinary work, taking on a partnership, so running a practice in 2012. And that was called a small business, but that employed 35 people and meant not only was I responsible for the clinical work, but I also had to run the business. I had to keep us afloat, make sure people were paid and work together with the other two partners in the business to make sure we had a coherent business plan, a structure, and we were financially solvent. However, we're here to talk about LARP and in 2012, we started to get back into LARP. We helped out the UK games company Profound Decisions as writers and world designers on their new fest game system, Empire. Next. Empire is a 3,500 person fest system which runs four events a year in the UK, or at least it did before COVID. It's a closed world system, unlike The Gathering, which means it has a coherent backstory and character backgrounds within the world. There was a lot of careful design went into it from a team of very experienced and skilled live role players. We wrote the background for three of the nations of the empire and helped create the world map and the history before the game started. This enticed us back into playing a big fest system again with a bunch of our old mates. It also got us into thinking about LARP again in a design and creative way. So we decided to run our first Crooked House event in a, a number of years. 
having learnt a lot in the intervening time and having a whole new bag of tricks up our sleeves. We also started looking around for other different systems to play to see what else was out there now. We'd heard a lot about international LARPs, so we decided we'd try some. We headed over to Poland and tried out College of Wizardry, uh, playing students at effectively what's a, a Harry Potter game. We did a couple of runs of Fairweather Manor, again in Poland. First time round we tried being aristocrats and the second time we played serving staff and that was really interesting. The style of LARP was very new to us, particularly the idea of pre-play and the idea that players are arranging plot between themselves before it actually happens in game. That sort of open style is unusual for us. We started running some events again. We got our enthusiasm back. The first one was in 2015. It was a Christmas ghost story set in a mansion, which for us at Crooked House was a, a new thing because we actually had beds and we could sleep indoors instead of camp outside in the wilderness. This had lots of special effects, stunts, atmosphere, and I'll say a lot more about it in another talk this weekend. We concentrated on environmental storytelling, set dressing, lots of psychological tricks to get players into specific states of mind. Again, it was heavy on the effects, and Bill and Kira spent a lot of time on stunts and puppetry. Here are some of the working production designs. And a lot of new technology had been created since we'd run our previous events, so we made good use of things like mini projectors, wireless speakers, vibration speakers, synthetic scents, and VR. Here's a, a sample of one of the projection tricks that we used. This is just recorded in our house. Now imagine seeing that happen in the middle of a corridor which you know is empty with a little bit of smoke just to cloudy things up, only lit by candlelight. And it's a figure that you knew and you'd seen before in photographs and you'd read about in newspapers and you'd slept in her bedroom and you'd seen what had happened to her. And then I helped out Allied Games, running a recreation of a plotting station crewed by the Women's Auxiliary Air Force in World War II. This was set at a, a real airfield that's now a museum in the UK. This game was built around a tech system designed by a friend, Nick Bradbeer and Thorsten Schillow from Germany, which recreated the actual activities these women would have used to track German aircraft on the run-up to the Battle of Britain. Again, we used lots of psychological trickery in the writing and design process. And there was a lot of very intense role play that came out of it as the core task was so critical. It kept everybody really focused. And we had emotional drama going on while that core task got harder and harder. It was fascinating seeing people's reactions within the game. It gave them and us a glimpse of what it might have been like at the time. And while it was by no means 100% accurate, it was probably a lot closer than watching a documentary or reading a book. Then we worked on All for One, our most recent Crooked House event, run along with Harry Harold. This was our Musketeers LARP, which we ran in 2019. Whilst writing All for One, we used moment-based design, which is something that we've developed since our earliest LARPs. We took all the key moments of what it would feel like to be a protagonist in the Musketeers movies, and wrote them down on a set of sticky notes. Our design process hinged on working out which of those moments were important and how we could make them happen for our players. We had a huge number of these moments and set pieces in the final game, which gave the players the chance to really feel like they were the protagonists in their own story. Highlights for us included finally getting horses to a LARP event after 25 years of trying, something that I'm really proud of doing. We let the players actually fire black powder muskets, much to their delight. We had a siege which allowed each group of players to storm the castle against overwhelming odds with dramatic set pieces designed for each of those groups, so everybody's siege was slightly different. We had a masked ball with special tweaks of the cinedrama rules which meant that any two people wearing the same mask could not be told apart under any circumstances. Given that we supplied the masks and we made sure that there were several duplicates of each design, this meant that many characters heard secrets that they should not have been privy to. We allowed the players to take part in a tavern brawl, fighting against a stunt crew with special LARP-safe furniture and props, 
including a chandelier that could be dropped on people's heads and sugar glass bottles and glasses that could be smashed over them. We created a training school for musketeers. The site we used for this was a wonderful 17th century mansion, which meant that the environment was immediately suitable for the story that we were trying to tell and really helped our players to get into character very quickly. We had an incredible cast of NPCs playing characters who were familiar from the films. Our fantastic catering staff came up with amazing meals, all cooked fully in character, whilst interacting with the players as they wandered through the kitchens. And in true film style, we were able to travel all around the world, as we had a linear area in the forest for action encounters, and a black box space with projectors and props which we could use for everything else. That became everything from the catacombs and the rooftops of Paris to a boat in the middle of the North Sea. I thought I'd try and sum up some of the design principles we've put together over the years by trying things, failing at things, seeing what works. Firstly, the most important thing for us is to always think about how you want the players to feel do you want them to be a detective? Then you have to use every trick in the book to make them feel like a detective. You want them to be a musketeer? Think about how to make them feel like a musketeer. Then design the rules to provoke those memorable moments that you want to happen. If you want your cast to bash their swords together and shout all for one and one for all, then why not make that a game mechanic? If you want people to feel like they can duel each other and win, even if they're not that great at sword fighting in real life, then find a mechanic system that lets you feel like they're a proper duelist. If you can put rules in which let players create moments and have fun, then they feel like they are making the story rather than it's something imposed by you. And don't save the best ideas you have for the sequel. For us, we think up everything we can possibly do and we throw it all in. Because some of it's not going to work, but an awful lot of it will and people will always remember those things. Use all the tricks in the book, stealing them from wherever you can find them, from film, theatre, computer games, live events. We had VR used in some of our games. We had smells used in some of our games. We had stage magic used in a lot of our games. Psychological trickery, all sorts of bits and pieces. For some reason, LARP is a nexus of all sorts of different creative disciplines. And because it does involve so many disciplines, collaborate with people. It will always come out better. Everybody has different ideas, everybody has different skill sets, so pull them all together and you'll create something amazing. And don't script everything too rigidly. It's something I think we made mistakes with in our early events. Be prepared for the players doing something that you just don't expect. With our later events, we actually don't write the endings anymore. We write a bunch of possible endings, but we get together on the Saturday night of an event and figure out what the real ending is. And most of that will be driven by what the players have actually done. And pick a good supporting cast, particularly your major NPCs, and trust them. Give them a brief, let them know what their character's about. Don't put lines into their mouths, let them improvise. And if they go away and make deals and come up with things that you don't expect, that's great. Roll with that. Trust them to do their best work. And at the end of the day, what do you want the players to be reminiscing about years from now, telling people they've never met before about their best LARP experience, the moment when they saw a tank the moment when the ghost burst into their room and drove them from their bed at night, the moment when the man in front of them caught fire, the moment when the monsters crawled out of the earth, the moment where they found the body of their best friend cut in half, but still blinking. These are what we love to create. And if you get those moments, the rest of it doesn't really matter. So what are we doing now? We have moved from the UK. We are now in Scandinavia. Rachel is a senior vet at a large independent practice near Stockholm, and I'm narrative director at Ubisoft, the games company in Stockholm, working on something super secret that's probably going to take a really long time. And a lot of what I owe to getting that role is stuff that I've learned in all of these different disciplines we've been discussing, and particularly LARP. So a couple of takeaways from me. Try lots of things that interest you whenever you get a chance. Particularly when working in the creative industries, you'll find that everything is relevant experience eventually. You're always learning lessons which you can bring across to your work, and you'll have a lot of fun too. And from me, as you get older, you realise you've accidentally spent a lot of XP on your contact skill. This means that you probably know someone who can help or advise you on almost anything. Cultivate those connections, and when they ask for help, 
say yes. We're continuing to create. Ian and I run a company called Story Worlds, where we create books, other interactive experiences and games and do some writing. You can read various pieces of writing on our Medium accounts and we'll continue to run LARPs in the future as Crooked House so people can make more wonderful memories. We're doing a couple of other talks for RopeCon, so we hope you'll be interested in listening to those as well. And thank you for listening.